Good evening, everyone. My name is Lou Hess. I have the pleasure of facilitating this evening's conversation. Um, and it's my pleasure in that context to welcome or to note that there's been 1,955 registrants. We expect that there might be um, a little less um, um, participants in terms of um, other competing commitments. But um, we're really delighted to welcome you to this webinar, providing culturally responsive mental health care during COVID-19 and beyond, as well as to the viewers who will watch this recording at a later stage. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which our webinar presenters and our participants are located. I would also like to pay my respects to elders past and present. This um, webinar um, is a partnership. Um, the Northwest Melbourne and Eastern Melbourne PHNs have contracted the Mental Health Professionals Network to deliver two webinars which aim to build the cultural responsiveness of primary health and mental health care practitioners to provide mental health support to people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds during COVID-19 and beyond. I will be facilitating both webinars and this is the first of the two. The second webinar, an interdisciplinary cross-cultural conversation exploring the meaning of healing and recovery will be broadcast live on Wednesday, March the 31st at 7.15. We do hope that you will be able to join us for the second webinar. We are, of course, we are of course interested to hear our audience views and you are invited to use the chat box. And finally, a brief comment on the ethos of our time together. As human service professionals, we are practiced at the art and science of imagining. And of course, in this regard, we also acknowledge the imaginings of the clients and the communities with whom we work. With appropriate acknowledgement and blessings to the technology gods who make tonight's connection possible, I ask you to imagine that we are sitting around a fire after dinner with either a hot chocolate or a red wine or two engaged in rich and exploratory conversation engaged in musings and yarnings with friends and colleagues from a multiplicity of human service disciplines about our professional practice with this particular client group. And that in this conversation around the fire, we'll demonstrate curiosity, we'll share practice wisdom, and engage with the professional and personal enigmas um, of working with a client group, many of whom do not have a cultural reference point for the involvement of our conversation. It's important to, for us to embrace the truth that conversations are seldom completed and that tonight's time-constrained engagement with culturally responsive mental health during the pandemic and beyond will inevitably crystallise more questions than provide simple answers. The only caveat on tonight's rich and expansive conversation by the fireside is that it will be my job to keep time, to time keep, to balance breadth and depth. And given my interest in conversations, I regret that I will sometimes be required to ask panellists to briefly respond um, or to comment succinctly. So, um, they're all um, important words of introduction. Um, now it's my pleasure, my very great pleasure, to introduce our panellists. As per the information contained in the brief biodata, Vu, Radhika and Francis are eminently well placed to contribute to our conversations on culturally responsive mental health during COVID and beyond. To complement the credentials identified in the biodata, and as a warm up to our conversation, I now want to invite our panelists to very briefly introduce themselves to us ethnically. 
Acknowledging that place of birth is but one marker of identity and that ethnic and cultural identity usually embraces both objective and subjective dimensions and is a dynamic and sometimes complex and, and contested, my invitation to the panellists will be to introduce yourselves ethnically um, and that will set the scene for our engagement with culturally responsive mental health. We could, of course, devote the whole evening to musings on ethnic and cultural identity, but in this regard, dear Vu, Radhika and Francis, you'll be invited to reply in one or two sentences. How do you identify yourself ethnically? So Vu, to you first, for a, a simple but important ethnic introduction. Hi everyone, my name is Vu. Um, I came originally from Vietnam but grew up in sunshine western part of uh, Melbourne. Uh, I'm a GP and um, my faith is Catholic. Thank, thanks Vu. Um, Radhika, an ethnic introduction please. Hello. Hello everybody. Lou, this is sounding like where are you really from? That kind of a question. <laughs> Well, I was born uh, in Jodhpur, Rajasthan, so I'm originally from India, and I migrated out of India about 30 years ago. Thank you. Thanks, Radhika. Francis? Well, the, the red hat might give it away, but more the clothes give it away. So while I'm from the Ga tribe of the, uh, from Ghana, my middle name is Ni Lante, uh, which is actually from the traditional area of Accra in Ghana. Thanks, Francis. And to complete the um, the introductions, um, I'm an Anglo-Australian bloke of working class background who slowly but I guess now intentionally is becoming more sensitive to my colour, to my whiteness and to the privilege that that embodies. So thanks everyone. As I said, um, we will, th those simple introductions are really I guess foundational to the conversations that we will have tonight in regards to cultural and ethnic identity. Um, some further um, comments in terms of introduction. Um, orientation to our webinar room. Most of the navigation buttons for functions are located in icons at the top right hand corner of your screen. There is a help button if you need assistance or you can message Redback directly or ring on the number 1800 733 416. Um, in terms of the format for tonight, each of the panellists will give a brief three to four minute discipline specific overview of what culturally responsive practice means to them. This will be followed by a panel discussion of three vignettes. The discussion will address the aims of the webinar in re regards to culturally responsive mental health. The registration process has also invited participants posing of questions of interest and some of these will be included in the question and answer section to the webinar. Please also note the ground rules document that will inform our co-creation of this space. The learning outcomes are listed on this slide but in summary tonight's webinar aims to capture and explore the opportunities the imperatives and the complexities of professional practice with clients of culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds during the pandemic and beyond. So without further ado, um, I'm now going to ask each of our panellists to very briefly, in about three minutes or thereabouts, speak to what informs their culturally responsive practice identifying four key ingredients and one myth or challenge. Um, further discussion of this content will 
will, will take place in the context of our reflection on the vignettes and, and we will be able to bring greater depth to these insights um, during that part of our webinar. So Vu, if I could hand over to you please, um, if you could talk about um, what informs your practice, etc. You're on mute, Vu. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Go ahead. What informs my cultural practice is that um, I've got experience growing up um, as a young boy in sunshine in a mixed cow background where my father was a refugee from Vietnam. Um, my 10 years or more of experience working as a GP dealing with the new refugees and new immigrants. Um, and some cultural awareness um, course or program um, that was taught during my GP training. Um, but I would say that it's still quite limited compared to um, the amount of um, practice or knowledge uh, compared to yours, Lou, or Radhika, um, or Francis. Um, I'm quite humbled to be on the panel, um, but at the same time, I would have to admit that my um, knowledge or experience is still quite limited compared to all yours. Thanks, Vu. And um, ingredients, myth and challenge, please. Well, the most important thing, um, the key ingredient would be to make sure that you allow the time. You, you need to frame the concept to, to be able to have the time to listen to your patients first. Um, and then the ability to show that mutual respect um, about their cultural beliefs. Um, and that has to do a lot of listening before you actually say anything. And then the, the third ingredient would be to be able to use the appropriate interpreters that is suitable for the client, whether it's the right dialect or the right sex, um, to, to make sure that whatever they're saying is clear and concise. Um, and a lot of the time that, you know, it might take a lot longer than the usual consult, but it's worth the while. And the fourth thing is to employ a cow health worker uh, that is appropriate to the community that you're looking after, whether it's a receptionist or whether it's a manager or whether it's a, a doctor or, or a nurse um, or LA health that works with the community. And I think the patient can often associate with that or having um, that sort of connection to turn up more. Thanks, Vu. A myth and a challenge, please. The, sorry. Um, one of the myths I find is that often um, patients are complaining about their mental health concerns um, and, and worries that it would actually bring shame to themselves and the family. And also, it has a lot of discrimination in the community and workforce. Um, so often, they seldom want to admit that they've got a mental health problem. And one challenge would be, um, I, I do find that a lot of the patients would need a lot more support than what Medicare would subsidise. Um, and, and how do we actually promote awareness or create more funding uh, for these communities of all. Thanks, Vu. Um, um, Radhika, if we could invite you to um, comment as Vu has. Sure. Um, but firstly, Vu, I just wanted to say, listening to your practice principles, I am. there's no way one can say you're not a peer par excellence with us. <laughs> Such a thank you, such mm -hmm. such beautiful principles and practice for a GP. Thank you. Still learning, Radhika. Still learning. Yes, and the lived experience too. Thanks, mate. Mm -hmm. um, so, basically, what informed my cultural practice is I grew up in in a de in a colonial context and the post-colonial education and so the entire kind of career and life has been 
how do I decolonize knowledge and values and beliefs? And so it's a work in progress. Um, what has helped me in, in that journey is my first degree was in philosophy. So being uh, an ethicist has helped me um, ground perspectives, I guess. And of course, being a brown migrant uh, female um, woman gives a lot of lived experience of how othering happens. So that's, yeah, that's that. Thanks, Radhika. Your chat uh, ingredients? Yeah, this was the hardest one, Lou, when you asked me to do, because, you know, one always thinks it's like choosing what's the best music you like or something, mm -hmm. because there are so many principles that one would like to share. Anyway, the one I want to share is that we are practitioners as a practitioner. We are imperfect allies, like, but we need each other. We need a sense of solidarity, and that's how culturally responsive practice can happen. It's not about clients. It's about the entire ecological system. And the second uh, principle or value that I want to bring is how do we honor spaces of not knowing, like, you know, the unknowable, truly to honor that, not to see it as a weakness or a vulnerability or and the third is my wife. I'm infatuated with uh, Winnicott, and it's a Winnicottian, as a Winnicottian um, holding environment, which is like, how can we hold an environment and contain it and not make the environment more aroused or more vigilant, which is what is happening in COVID? So um, it is, how do we create and contain a holding environment is something that I'm very um, interested and, and deeply engaged with. And the last one is about learning practices of culture and repair, which is how do we uh, want, because we all make mistakes and we make more often than what we think we do, but how do we repair? How do we do reparative processes um, is, is a question that looms large. Thanks, Radhika. And a myth and a challenge? Yeah, the myth that I find is that, you know, like how we say clients are not one size fits all. I want to say again and again, practitioners are not one size fits all. Uh, but we are seen like like people who say, oh, you're a psychologist, or oh, you're a psychiatrist, or oh, you're a GP, or, you know, somehow we are one size fits all. And I'm going to say, no, I'm not. I'm radical or something like that. And the challenge is for me is, Certainly the intersectional lens, or what used to be called the social and political determinants of health and, and well-being, how do we bring that to understand not client narratives, I'm not thinking of that, how do we bring that to understand communities narratives and systems narratives? The systems bring very complex histories with them. So that's, that's the end of my uh, speech. Thanks, Radhika. We'll pick up some of that in our next section. Um, Francis, could you speak um, briefly to um, uh, your perspectives? Well, it's been uh, a journey. So coming to Australia from England, I settled next to La Trobe University or the old Morando Hospital. And of course, soon we were starting to get uh, students but also in the early um, 90s, we started getting uh, African refugees. So I went to try and explore further. How do we help uh, people from a different cultural background? Of course, being the only African in the whole of that municipality, I became the person who people were calling a home. And sooner I needed to expand my knowledge. So why do I expand my knowledge? I needed to know about the Jewish community. I needed to know about the Vietnamese community, the Italian community, the Greek community. And therefore decided to gain more knowledge around how and why we, the people who are not Caucasians, have 
deeper but different perspective of mental health. And I guess even today, when the Royal Commission has um, uh, hand down their report on mental health, the majority of the people from the non English speaking background will be the people who will be most disadvantaged. Of course, we come with stigma. Stigma is a big issue in terms of the negativity. How do you uh, explore something that you're not aware of? And sooner or later, I connected our own ancestral spirit. What do we gain? What uh, do our ancestors, what do we learn as a culture? And how do we transform this culture into our everyday life? And this is so, how my practice has continued to evolve. So, so Francis, some rich comments there. Could you speak, please speak briefly to your mental health, uh, to, to the four key ingredients, um, but um, briefly, please. Yes. So, of course, spirituality, um, and, of course, the issue around multiculturalism. What does that mean? How do we, as a practice, so now I have a center here in Epping, and my picture there portrays that people need to come to the center and meet people from a vast variety of backgrounds. So we have people from Vietnamese background, from Iraqi background, from African background, Caucasian working in the center. And that's how we connect to the people that come to our center. We embrace the community by education. I'm a mental health day trainer, so we constantly am advocating for these people, but also training them to understand their mental health and how to gain support. So Francis, we'll pick up some of this rich, um, uh, rich comments in our next session, but could you just talk to your one myth and your one challenge? The myth is about the assumption, the prejudice, the lack of understanding about our cultures. And therefore, I'll give a very brief but concise example. I have trained a lot of mental health clinicians and say, if you're giving an African an appointment, please don't give them a 10 o'clock appointment. Probably easy to say, come today and we'll see you today, rather than expecting them to be there at 10 o'clock and they won't turn up. Of course, the issue around conscious and unconscious bias. You get through the door, it is my clothes. I wear this every day. I wear my right, right hat, <laughs> red hat almost every day. So my community, that my mental health community knows that Francis wears his red hat. And I wear these clothes, you know, my pajamas. They are my everyday clothes. Thank, thanks, Francis. We will, as I said, pick up some of um, these comments in our next session. Um, again, mindful of my role in, in managing the time, I'm sorry if we've had to rush, but let's move now on to the section where we discuss the vignettes. Um, and the vignettes are not case studies in the traditional sense, but rather have been designed to provide the opportunity for the identification of a range of poignant practice issues relevant to mental health for cold communities in a pandemic and beyond. And our discussion will invite a multidisciplinary approach, even though the vignettes speak to particular disciplines. So let me start by referring to Abdul's story. Abdul's story is replete with many invitations for professional engagement. To commence our conversations, I make explicit reference to Abdul's God-centeredness. God-centeredness is a primary value of many who arrive in Australia as part of our refugee and special humanitarian programs or and or who are of culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. 
This is sometimes expressed in the Islamic sentiment, Allahu Akbar, God is greater, and the Christian sentiments regarding the presence of God, Emmanuel, God is with us. The value, this value, way of being and doing in the world, has the potential to be a significant protective factor in both enabling clients and communities to cope during the, uh, with the challenges of COVID-19, but also to buttressing their mental health and daily functioning per se. In Abdul's words, my God will prevail. For some, COVID-19 does have the potential, however, to threaten and indeed dismantle such protective factors. Where is God? I have been abandoned. Informed by Abdul's story, but also thinking more broadly, I now want to um, invite each of our panellists to comment on your observations, your experiences in regards to clients' utilisation of God-centredness or faith as a protective factor. So, Luke, if we could start with you. Um, in terms of your rich practice in the, the wonderfully diverse sunshine in the west of Melbourne, um, how often do you, in your consults with patients, have to engage with faith or spirituality, or or what or God centeredness, or what Abdul would say, um, my God will prevail. I think um, Lou, um, around forty percent of my patient would um, highlight um, their God, um, whether it's the Buddha or the the, the Jehovah or, or whatever God that they, they, they name, and I have no issue with involving the God um, uh, to, to understand uh, their, uh, their belief and also um, I utilize that as a positive um, way to engage with them to say that you know um, I'm here not to distract you from any path I'm here to be guiding you along to be assisting you going through the hard time with you you know um, and, and you can continue to pray to your God so that um, you'll get better. But I'm here to facilitate and guide you along. That's all. Um, I would not disregard any of the beliefs. Um, I would say that it's, a, it's an actually an important thing um, to maintain the belief because that, like you mentioned, Lou, it's a protective factor. And, and I, I'd use it to a positive sense to treat Thanks, Vu. Um, Radhika, um, your reflections on my God will prevail. Yes, my God will prevail, which is what a lot of people in the United States are saying. Um, <laughs> so one of the things I want to say is that a, not just clients, a lot of practitioners are profoundly devout. It's just that they don't reveal it. So there is this kind of um, scheme that happens that somehow the Zamshis practitioners are all from secular background because the training is secular, but that doesn't mean the everyday living reality for practitioners is secular. A lot of them are devoutly, are, are very devout practitioners, whatever, whatever faith they come from. So I want to emphasize that. And I'm very um, drawn to what has come into the literature as what's called culture, religious competence as cultural competence. So we want practitioners to become competent in taking a spiritual history. We want to know even if the person is not going to. So a lot of my clients do talk about God. But even if they don't, I do ask that, do you have any strong faith practices? How do they help or hinder your journey in, in this life or in this struggle? And what do you, very similar to Vu, what do you want me to do in order to support you in this? How would you like for me and our team to help you with your practices? Like, are there any letters we should give to your office so you can pray or what kind of things? And there's one interesting um, 
um, I think it, it's in a video too in the Victorian Transcultural Mental Health. We included it a while ago. There was an interesting uh, video of a, a psychiatrist in Vancouver saying he did um, a faith-related practice in the ward so that the family will keep the client in the ward rather than discharge him and take him home. So these are profound practices of co-designing recovery. So it is not so much about whose faith prevails, whether you believe in DSM and you believe in God and DSM prevails or ICD prevails. It's basically saying, can we have a middle ground of being able to see multiple perspectives, plurality of ideas in order for you and I to to recover, I mean, and to heal. Because if we have less number of clients in the world, isn't that good for practitioners too, if the struggles are less? So, yeah. Thanks, Radhika. Um, Francis, um, can you complement our um, conversation thus far with, with your no, that... engagement with spirituality? Yeah. Well, the, the engagement with spirituality, I mean, one of the books that I have is, is called The Spirit of Intimacy. How, what does our spirit contribute to our mental health? In fact, I use what I call the will of life as part of our conversation around the needs of the individual. And our spirituality forms a greater part of it. Whether you believe in anything, um, as Radhika said, we are now using um, evidence-based, of course, mindfulness in itself has come through where? Through the Buddhism type of teaching, and now we are setting it up. So spirituality is a very key part of our contribution to our well-being. And in, in practice, as a mental health nurse, we want to look at somebody in a holistic, in a comprehensive, in an integrated service, being able to capture every part of their living being into improving their well-being. And hence, for me, it's about using their wealth of their personal knowledge. A Jew having a kosher kitchen, a Vietnamese going through Buddhism, Christian, I've just come back from Africa, and there are more churches <laughs> than you can think about. But that's where the people derive their spirituality, their wealth of health. And so, yes, we need to also be able to distinguish whether that part of religion is also affecting them. But a lot of the time, as a mental health nurse, we are connecting the people to areas that will help them to actually get the better treatment, i.e. helping somebody to connect to the local mosque, whereby they could go and pray on a Friday, connecting with religious people so that they could go and get some religious food on the weekend. All That's right. Thank, th thank, thanks, Francis, and everyone. Um, so acknowledging, I guess, um, that spirituality um, for this client group, but all more, or, but more broadly, um, is becoming more acknowledged um, as being a part of progressive and respectful human service practice. I now want to invite, again, brief comment on given that it's not necessarily a traditional orthodoxy for human service professionals, although there's obviously some um, commonality in, amongst the panellists, what are some useful questions for eliciting an assessment of the relevance of God-centeredness? Um, all disciplines assume a secular stance. So how do we as practitioners discuss issues of God-centeredness or spirituality? How do we engage with Abdul 
in the notion of my God will prevail. Um, Vu, would you like to make brief comment on, on how you have those conversations? Are you very open and direct or what happens in your practice? Lou, for me, I'm quite open um, about talking about God, but often I would actually, um, part of my job is to assess for the risk in terms of suicidal risk as well as assessing for hallucination as much as a believer. But um, if, if um, the client is saying that, well, my God stopped talking to me or my God is telling me to do certain things, then certainly that, uh, that's where I draw the line and say, well, well we, we need help. Um, it, it's more than just talking about um, um, the, 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 the strong belief and all that. Um, so I use the faith as a way to assess where they're at, they're at uh, and their mental health well-being. Um, often, if they are well enough, then they would often tell us that my God is still guiding me and I still have hope. Uh, and faith, which is really good, but when they have given up or said my God has forgiven, uh, or abandoned me, then uh, that, that's where the alarm bells start to ring. Um, or if they're saying that uh, I've been praying to my God, I've been talking to Him 24 hours, and and I'm not able to do anything else, that's also a concerning for me as well. Okay, thanks, Vu. Um, Radhika, um, that is, how do you engage? Yeah. That is so good, Vu, because I always want God to be part of my care team. You know, it's the worst thing when they say God has abandoned me because God is one of the most strongest players in the care team, you know. So it's like their grandmother or, you know, their hands. Sadly, you seem to have frozen. Oh. Go ahead, go ahead, Radhika. The, the outcome usually is similar to VU, where I absolutely want a long drawn exploratory conversation. But I use um, particular, um, there are assessment tools, and I use the cultural formulation, which gives an entire sheet on how to ask faith based questions. So some of the questions will be something like, do you have any spiritual beliefs that help you cope with your current situation? And then other question will be, do you have a spiritual community that you're part of? Are they helpful or are they hindering your progress? And some question would be, how would you like me as your therapist to address some of these spiritual issues? What would you like me to do? So there is a series of questions that uh, cultural formulation gives on faith-based care that I used often and regularly. Lou? Thanks, Radhika. Um, Francis, could you add briefly to that your response to that curious question around how you actually engage with um, patients, with clients? Yes, uh, this is, I should say, it's part of my uh, daily practice. So that comes into conversation on a regular basis. And my practice is actually full of uh, multicultural people. Um, and and um, over the years, people come from so many different places. And the important thing is connecting them with uh, religious uh, uh, places. Uh, I have a client who lives all the way in uh, Brunswick. And we connected her uh, with a uh, Thai uh, religious group all the way in Boxville. And she felt extremely connected. So it depends upon what the client wants and how we can facilitate those uh, services. Thank, thanks, Francis, and everyone. Clearly, there's lots of more um, richness that we could. Um, examine in regards to Abdul's story, but let's move now on to Leanne, Leanne's story. Leanne's story highlights many factors. Relationship, the importance of significant others and the importance of extended family. Many people of refugee or asylum seeking and or culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds are in Australia 
bereft of or with very limited relationship support. Sometimes this means that service providers are the only or the most significant other to people of refugee, asylum seeker or cold backgrounds. In Leanne's story, she seems to be privileging relationship with the psych, psych registrar, um, understanding is all that I need is her important narrative. Your warmth makes me feel much better. What is your experience, dear panellists, of significant others for this client group? Does it sometimes require you to nuance your role differently? Who are you relationally with clients of culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds? Um, so, um, Vu, can you make some brief comments on your significant other role, your relationship role for so many people who are here with out extended families and without significant relationships? Well, Lou, uh, I find that with these sort of patients here, um, I, I think a lot of us would love to be able to get some magical quick fix medication that can just cure them overnight, but uh, we know very well that it doesn't work like that. And we do have to listen to the patient's needs because you find that being patient enough to give them the time and, and to, to build rapport. And you'll find that they'll be able to tell you a lot more than what's on the surface. Um, so a lot of these clients, um, they would be judging and, 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 and to see whether you, you'll be willing to listen to them. Because I find that um, if you give them, whether it's a once a week appointment or once a fortnightly appointment, to, to allow them to voice their ideas and, and worries they will tell you a lot more. And then that allows you to engage and help. And, and you're right, a lot of the time it's the talking therapy. So even though I'm a GP, um, you know, where I, I should be thinking a lot about medication, but we know very well that um, a lot of these patients, they don't really like to use medication because of um, the stigma. I guess, associated with having the diagnosis and having to be on medication. So we, we just need to be so patient and give them the time that's need, whether it's 20 minutes or half an hour um, per consult. It's nowhere near what um, the councillors would provide. But as a GP, that was, if that's all we can afford, we'll, we'll have to live with that, I guess. Um, but allowing them the time to talk, I guess. Thanks, Boo. Um, Radhika, your comments on the importance of relationship with this client group? It, yeah, I, I'm, I, if I can, Lou, I'd like to talk about, this is such a relational story, but more about the psych registrar in the character. Yes, yes. It is also a story of the psych registrar because it starts off with the narrative of the supervision making her feeling inadequate. So I kind of think there is relational failures everywhere and there is this need for quick fix or as Wu was saying, can some magic pill be given or can we just pass the buck to a perinatal unit or, and there is a question uh, from the audience I think that's come to the panelists on the perinatal services around during COVID time. What I want to suggest in terms of this, this happens, this is something very close to my heart. I, I am a at, uh, attachment practitioner. I work with a lot of families with under five children. And in attachment work, we say this is such a beautiful story because it's like you have to build a circle of network for safety. So it's not just one mother's group, it's not one GP, it's not one psychiatrist. You want to create a circle of like a care team. So basically, you mentioned that, Lou, when you started, that I find, for me, that healthcare services are extended networks of support, not just for refugees and asylum seekers and diverse communities, for all vulnerable people. 
So either healthcare services can restore social bonds or they can disrupt social bonds. And we don't work as a team. The healthcare service providers always do not work as a team or as a, they don't see themselves as a micro community. They split and triangulate each other sometimes. So this is where my request would be, we need to build a circle of safety, which is almost like a, a safety network so that Leanne will not fall through that. Thanks, Radhika. Um, very interesting um, comments that we could bring more depth to. But Francis, um, uh, obviously in terms of what you've said before, you're, you are very significant to many of your 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 clients. So would you might like to make some brief comment on the importance of relationship in your professional practice with this cohort? Well, I, I, this is the work that I really love and I really enjoy by really working with clients in their own space. And I have developed almost an outreach uh, place where I see the clients where they want to be seen. And, and, and this really, I have clients from as far as the Kilmore to um, the Bayswater through to uh, Windenville uh, and so on. But it's about working together. It's about that word multicultural sorry, multicultural but multidisciplinary group. How do you assess how do you assess a psychiatry? Um, and it is absolutely difficult to, to find a psychiatry. But I'm so lucky to have a group of psychiatrists who I call upon. Even at times when there is a difficulty in the clients actually paying the Medicare difference, I get psychiatrists to sometimes fulfill these clients. And it's about keeping that client in the center of the universe, I call it, and assisting them with other things. Our clients come in at their most vulnerable state. I usually say, I go to with them to see a psychiatrist and I interpret English. Even if the person can speak English, sometimes they are so anxious, they're so frightened, they're not able to go in and express all their needs. And I physically go with them. I physically go with, with my clients to court sometimes and okay. help them thank, in those areas. Thank, thanks, Francis. Um, and everyone. Um, again, my job as timekeeper is an unenviable one. Um, we want to um, absolutely bring depth to these important comments, but I think it's also important that we make some room for engagement with our third vignette. Um, and we've got about uh, 12 minutes or thereabouts for this part, but I wanted to ask, dear, dear colleagues, um, a comment about the invite a comment about the pandemic um, per se. Um, my sense is in terms of my client work that the lockdown and the pandemic has really exacerbated for many clients of asylum seeking background, of refugee background, of clients with limited relational context. It's exacerbated their mental health challenges. But I've also been aware that for some of the clients that I work with, the pandemic hasn't been um, all that impactful or hasn't appeared to be all that impactful because they have a pre-pandemic experience of constraints on their life. They have a pre-pandemic experience of um, living with less. Um, and so I'd be interested um, for each of you to make some um, brief comment on whether during the pandemic you have a sense that in what ways the mental health concerns of our clients have been um, exacerbated, but have there been some experiences that you've had, like mine, where, the, where there have been some positive um, coping mechan mechanisms demonstrated? 
So Vu, over to you, and again, brief comments, please. Lou, uh, for mine, um, it's pretty much a mixed response. Um, there are lots of mental health patients out there who find that with COVID, um, it, it was actually a lot better, given that they could ac actually access their GPs or psychologists through telehealth, where previously they couldn't even leave their house. The fact that we're able to call, call them through, through the phone to engage with them, I think that's great success. But then again, there'll be other groups out there who would struggle to keep up with the news, knowing, uh, um, knowing what to do or when to do the checkup, or, or, or are too fearful to leave the house, uh, fearing that um, they'll catch COVID or worried about the fact that they might get a fine. So those groups there are quite at a big disadvantage um, and it's a struggle because um, we don't know when we'll get to engage with them unless we've made a special list and call out to those ones that we need. Um, so I find it quite mixed. Okay, thanks, Vu. Um, Radhika, much a similar experience to Vu or other comments that you might make? Yeah, very similar, but I also want to say you're right in that um, a lot of our clients know what it is um, to deal with uncertainty. They know how to deal with unpredictability and some sense of, you know, relentless anxiety and fear, something might go wrong. That kind of thing, they have lived with it for such a long time. But now it has come to the middle class practitioner. So strangely, they, some of them told me, oh, now you know what it is for me. Now you're, mm -hmm. So it's like a strange sense of equity that's come. And so there is a little bit more empathy sharing both ways, I find, because um, a lot of us are not able to see our parents or our children graduate or our children finish school. So there is a sense of camaraderie that's come in. So that's, that's the thing I find due to COVID, and we are all trying to hold hands. Thanks, um, Radhika. Um, Francis, your comments on... Um, the impact well, of COVID on our client group. Yeah, and I'm going to take it in two perspectives. I have had a whole lot of clients who, some of them I haven't seen for four, five, six, seven, even eight years, who have reconnected during this COVID time. Um, we've had the opportunity to continue to work face to face, but also the opportunity to use the telehealth. Um, and we should be sitting here and still encouraging the government to consider adding mental health nurses to the Medicare uh, ribbon with telehealth. Sorry, I have to put this one in there because it's so important. Some of us have continued to provide services in that area. Our clients have come back and within a short period of time, they've been satisfied. We also need to look at our core community a cultural linguistic background community. Unfortunately, they are still not accessing services. Why? Because they come from not the individualistic societies that we know of as Australia. They come from collective societies. They want to go to church together. They want to go to the mosque together. They want to go to the, um, the temple together. And so they are also missing out during COVID, and we need to find other ways on supporting these people who Thanks. are really isolated. Japan has just appointed a minister of loneliness. Have a look at it. One of my friends in Canada has provided is a professor at Japan, and he's using what he calls test for hope. Test for hope. Test for hope sends messages to clients on their phone, and they are able to respond with their mental health. Thank, thanks, Francis. Some very interesting um, observations or comments that you've made that we could expand in greater depth if we had time. So clearly, in terms of Leon's story, there is lots to invite our engagement. Let's move on briefly to Fung. Um, 
and we've really only got about five minutes, um, so we're not really demonstrating as much respect as I would like to to Fung's story. But Fung's story highlights, amongst other things, the relevance of cultural values as a protective factor and the potential for resistance or to departure from cultural values of family origin in response to a range of Australianising influences. Cross-cultural um, conflict um, can clearly emerge. So again, briefly, what is your observation or experience of cultural values of family of origin losing their protective factor or status and in fact introducing further um, vulnerability through conflict, particularly during a pandemic. So the, um, you know, clearly Fung is of Vietnamese background, um, but can you make some brief and general comment about the protection that cultural values can offer or not in a time of pandemic? I, I think the, um, the cultural protective factor of these, um, uh, from, from Vinny's background, often um, he can guarantee that he would have a lot of support from his family uh, in terms of um, whether it's money or moral support and all that. But sometimes I feel like um, these sort of um, protective factors, they, they in return, there's, um, the parents would be having um, unreasonable expectations of what he should be doing. Um, so the fact that he's working part-time or as a casual uh, would be seen as a failure in the community, or the fact that he's not uh, doing well at university would be seen as a failure as well. So I think culturally speaking, um, there is unmatched expectation between what Fulms could achieve and what uh, the family is expecting of him. Thanks, for Radhika. You know, um, Lou, probably Fung was the one narrative that spoke so much to me because I saw a lot of young people during COVID and continue to. I mean, this year is not any different. Um, where that line, I want my freedom. They, are, they were sick of the lockdown and being locked in with parents and grandparents and siblings. And at 19, it just felt like hell for them. So for, Fung is one that I, I, I'm very drawn to in terms of my relational space at this moment of all the three narratives. I feel it's so unfair for the young people with the pandemic year where everything is expected of them. They have to go to school, finish exams, do everything, and yet they have to be inside their room, locked in. Having said that, it also had a lot of alarm bells in terms of, you know, volatile relationships and taking meth with friends for the first time. But at this moment, all I want to do is to listen deeply to Fung. Just listen, nothing else. Because it feels like nobody is listening to them. Thanks, Radhika. Um, uh, profound words. Um, Francis. It's about dialogue. I usually say, the Chinese say, the crisis is an opportunity. And it's also so much that during this, even this COVID pandemic, which most of us have never experienced, I'll call it a war that we are going through, it's also an opportunity for the connection. So how do we as family group connect? One of my recent uh, discussion is board games. We've forgotten. Even when I mentioned the word Ludo, a lot of people didn't know what Ludo is. Scrabble. How do we sit there and engage with our family? Unfortunately, most of us in this um, um, court community are sometimes three generations living in one home. And how do you connect with them? How do you go for a walk with your old... Um, I had a picture, unfortunately, it's, it's disappeared. But I'll show you one of my pictures, young lady. But there we are in the village. 
a young young person will be walking with grandma to the shop. How do we engage, re-engage with some of those activities? How does the teenagers being allowed, like I was in Ghana recently, to go and play soccer by themselves? So we need to look at a different way of re-engaging with society. And post-COVID, let's start thinking outside the square. Let's start re-engaging with ourselves from our home to our community, as a state and as a nation. I think. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Thanks, um, Francis. Um, time is rapidly evaporating in the twinkling of an eye, but we've had some very interesting conversation thus far. Now I want to invite acknowledging the richness of our conversations and the time constraints, I now want to invite you to ident identify in a very few words a key take-home message regarding culturally responsive mental health care in a pandemic and beyond. So again, just cap try and capture that, that richness, that depth, the complexity in just a few words. So the, what's your take-home message, brief take-home message in regards to mental health responsiveness for culturally and linguistically diverse pe um, people and communities in a pandemic and beyond? I think um, the most important thing for me would be lo knowing our limitations and have a network of um, ordered, supportive uh, health workers, whether it's a mental health nurse or a social worker or a psychologist or a psychiatrist, to be involved in the team um, so that there's no one size fits all. That's a essential theme. Uh, we need to work together as a team to help the clients in any way we can and to link them in with the community. Uh, the earlier, the better. I like what Francis said about you know, connecting them to the church group or church leaders so that they could get food. It could be as simple as that. And I love that idea. And, you know, if, if they're starving and they haven't got any money and, and food is the most important thing, go for it. You know, uh, I, I don't mind um, whatever religious belief they've got, but I'll tell them, you go down that road, there's that food store there, they give out food for free, you just take. And, and that is survival. Um, and I think that um, the more networking we've got, the more connections we can build, I think the better for the client. Thanks, Phil. Um, Radhika, a takeaway take away message. Um, so when I'm listening to a worldview or a perspective that's very different to what I know and what I feel, I would like for us practitioners to not see it as um, a contest, but to be able to, with open hands and open heart, to make that a space of learning, listening, and teaching from each other, so perspectives can flourish. Thanks, Radhika. And Francis? Once again, I will do a small show and tell of a young person are walking with their, I'll call it grandma, an elder person from the village. They start holding hands together to support people with mental health. And as the Royal Commission report has come out, let this be a practical and enduring service for people with mental health. People should be able to walk into any service and receive a service on the day, not to come back tomorrow or come back in two weeks' time. It, it, I could write a book on my negative experience, but I want that to end up on a, on a positive note that today is going to be a new day in the mental health services in Australia and in the world, and COVID despite the negativity that is produced, is going to end up with us being positive. Of course, we are all flying again, 
what happened to September 11? The plane stopped. The planes are back in the air. The airport is quiet. The, air, the planes will come back. So let's, um, well, let's end up with a positive uh, environment for our mental health clients. I thank you. Thanks, thanks Francis. And now, um, as facilitator, I'd like to provide just a very brief summary. Um, tonight's conversation um, has provided us with some important glimpses into the, both the opportunities and the complexities involved in culturally responsive mental health care during the pandemic and beyond. Our conversations, every one of them, of course invited greater depth than was allowed by an hour and 15 minute time constraints. Hopefully, our conversations have also stimulated a raft of other questions that can be reflected on in an ongoing way. The supportive resources posted in the support tab will also assist in this regard um, and you will receive subsequent to this um, webinar some follow-up communication from the Mental Health Practitioner Network. Um, MHPN also supports the engagement and ongoing maintenance of practitioner networks. Um, you will be advised of how to contact MPHN if this is of interest or indicate via the exit survey which we encourage you to complete. Our next webinar, an interdisciplinary cross-cultural conversation Exploring the Meaning of Healing and Recovery is scheduled for March the 31st. We do hope that you can join us. In final conclusion, thanks again to our panellists for inviting us into this very interesting space. Thanks also to all involved, technical, admin, and production roles um, which have enabled this webinar to be possible. As um, someone frightened of technology, um, my own view is that, that um, this process is um, magical in terms of bringing together around the metaphorical fireside with our cups of um, hot chocolate or red wines, um, given us a chance to engage with hundreds of people in Victoria and beyond in our musings, in our reflections, in our dialogue around how we make sense of, how we demonstrate justice and humanity and relationship mm -hmm. to those in our community who are of refugee or asylum seeker background or and or um, culturally and linguistically diverse um, backgrounds. So thank you, Vu. Your, your contributions have been really rich. Radhika, um, very wonderful um, insights to get us thinking. And Francis, your international perspective and the comments that you've made in terms of your local work have also stimulated, I'm sure, lots of um, interests and lots of thinking. So, and to all of the participants, um, thank you for your engagement with this topic. Um, thank you for your participation in this webinar and we hope that it has um, been useful in stimulating some thinking, in affirming many of your um, practices, many of your approaches to engaging with cultural and linguistic diversity um, in a time of pandemic and beyond. On behalf of everybody, good night and thanks.